After decades of dependability and proven performance, the Chrysler car has become synonymous with muscle and power. It is without a doubt the most sought after brand at auctions, online and across the globe. Setting and breaking records for the most valuable classic cars ever sold. The road has been rough, but our often marginalized Mopars are finally on the top of the mountain. Whether wrecked, rusted, or abandoned to the elements, we will find them and bring them back from the dead. It's what we do. This is Graveyard Cars. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman, his cousin, Doug, his daughter, Alyssa, his best friend, Royal, his painter, Will, and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. For those of you who are big fans of Graveyard Cars, you'll remember a few seasons ago, we had a 1958 Plymouth Fury come out for a visit. This car belonged to a gentleman named Bill. It was all tricked out. It had the power windows. It had the seat that moved automatically. When he brought that car out and we crawled all over it and had some fun with it, I realized that I really wanted to do one of those cars someday. Now, Bill's car was a really nice replica of the movie car, right down to the 350 Golden Commando engine. When that car came out and it rolled into the assembly shop, I'll tell you, I just instantly fell in love. It's a beautiful car, right? It was beautiful. It was the inspiration down the road for me to build Christine for the SEMA show. But having that car out and all the fun we had with it, I even got Royal, if you guys want to roll back and poor old Royal, he, he excremented himself because he didn't know that I had it all controlled with remote control. He thought somebody was actually, the ghost was driving the car. Come on, Royal, you're smarter than that. Hey, that is cool. Hold on your window. Check him out. OK, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. We had Christine, the mayor of Springfield, out. That was a lot of fun. Got some really cool photographs with her. The interesting thing here, and bear with me as we rehash a few things here, a lot of the car was built from the leftover parts from the movie cars. So no, it wasn't ever a screen car, but a lot of the parts that are on the car were on cars that were screen cars. And what better tribute could one ask for for a Christine? Remember when Arnie was out in the scrap pile and, and Darnell comes up and says, well, I told you you could use some of the parts in my scrap pile. I didn't say you could build the whole, and he uses a bad word, thing out of it. So you're getting the parts now. Told very clearly by Darnell that he could have those parts. And then, yeah, and there he is, the hater. And then Arnie says, um, well, what do you care? You're not using it. Hey! Hey! It gets all crazy. So what's the next question now? So I think it's time for me to address the elephant in the room. So now if we fast forward a few years to SEMA, I think it was 2018, when Mopar introduced the 1,000 horsepower elephant. Introducing another first for Mopar. Plug and play, 1,000 horsepower, Mopar 426 supercharged Elephant Crate Hemi engine. What was really cool is after we premiered the engine, started it, I had no idea this was gonna happen, but they presented me with the engine. They gave it to me. And Mark, since you're a good friend of Mopar and a good friend of Pietro, I'm gonna consider you a friend of mine, and by the way, that engine's yours. You can use it in one of your project cars coming up. How about that? Are you serious? I'm serious. So if you see me looking a little bit off kilter for the ice tray, that's why, that was real, I had no idea. The year before they gave me the Mopar Brand Ambassador Award and I was, well, that one probably even affected me more because that's a lifetime achievement type thing, so. It is the 2017 Mopar Brand Advocate Award. 
Congratulations. That's why I probably have the only one in the world that's ever been given out. Not the point, but something that should be noted. <laughs> It's a little humbling when you're up on stage and the president of Mopar brings out an award and uh, announces that you're the very first brand ambassador to Mopar, so. It doesn't mean I'm any different, right? I still put my pants on one leg at a time. You know, I don't know why we're still talking about the same damn Mopar award. It's a beautiful award, and hands down, Mark has earned it. I will never take that away from him. But it's a plaque. This doesn't make me smarter than everybody else or funnier. More, well, I'm already probably funnier because I'm a natural comedian, but it is what it is, you know. You don't let stuff like that go to your head. Just a guy doing his job. Mark Hackett got the award, that's great, but Richard Rawlings, when Gas Monkey would be on TV, he got a new truck every season. Piece of plastic, $80,000 truck. You see what I'm getting at? Some of the guys backstage were giving me a hard time that, you know, I kind of choked up when they gave me the Mopar Brand Ambassador Award. And, uh, I just had something in my eye wow. up there. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Wow. No, I didn't choke up. Okay, have you ever been to Las Vegas? It's really dry, right? So it's like so dry. I'm used to Oregon where it's completely wet and my eyes dried out and because they do, your water, it doesn't matter. Just what's the next question? The whole idea behind giving me this experimental 1,000 horsepower all aluminum engine was that I had to put it in something fitting, something that would represent the world's most evil engine, thus Christine. I was on the way back driving from SEMA and I got to thinking about what am I gonna put it in, what am I gonna put it in, and it just hit me. I'm gonna put it in a 58 Fury and I'm gonna do a tribute to the Christine movie car. World's most evil car, world's most evil engine. You know, as soon as I got back from SEMA, the first thing I did was sit down, made some phone calls, and tried to find a 58 Belvedere, Fury, anything that I could make look like the car from Christine. I got a lead on one in Pennsylvania. Real nice fella. So we made the deal, I bought that car. That's kind of older material. If you go back and watch some of the earlier episodes, which are all available on YouTube for free, be sure to subscribe. You'll see where I bought that car, brought it out here. I knew it was a rough car. Maybe it was a little bit rougher, had a lot of problems. You're gonna see a lot more. You're gonna learn a lot more like I did. I learned a ton on that car. We're gonna walk you through a lot of stages that you haven't seen before, all leading up to the grand reveal of this amazing car. So the Plymouth Fury is the second SEMA car that I've got to work on here. It's just a really cool car to be able to work on since it's, you know, based off the movie and we're putting a pretty killer engine in it. Mark and Doug modified the frame to fit the engine in. They got that installed. So then I was able to be a part of uniting the body to the frame. This was fun to build out, but it was sure out of our wheelhouse. But Mark and I worked on cars, mini bikes, go-karts, and everything for over the past half a century. We can build just about anything if we set our minds to it. Once we all had all the paint work done and we had it set back down in the frame, the fun stuff could start. The reassembly, the final assembly of Christine. All I remember about that whole thing was we had like 90 days to finish the car and we really just got started on it. So it was suicide shifts back to back around the clock. We were working outside in the cold, working outside in the freezing, getting things ready. We were so jammed in the shop. None of us could work during the day on it because we had customer cars that had to be done. So we worked our butts off to get that thing done. You know, Christine was just a nightmare. We're not familiar with the car, so it's out of our wheelhouse. We can do it, it just takes time. Mark doesn't give us that time. So at this point, you know, we got the headliner that Larry's installing. I'm trying to get the paint buffed. It's like all hands on deck. And nobody really knows what's going on because we don't know how to put the damn car together in a time crunch. It was all hands on deck. Will was buffing the car. Mark and I were working on all the trim. Justin and Alyssa were doing the wiring. Larry was working on the headliner. And I'll just say this, 
It was the last day before the truck was showing up. The truck was going to be there at 8 o'clock the following morning, and I believe it was a Friday, to get the car picked up. And we still didn't even have brakes on it yet. <laughs> we hadn't bled the brakes out. So Doug and I were there till 2 in the morning the night before the truck came to pick it up, but we made it. Finally, finally got it capped, ready to go, pushed it around to the side for when the truck showed up. When we unveil this car next season, just a little teaser, we're going to cover a lot of the press that that car got. It was one of the most talked about cars. It, it blew me away, probably because of the elephant, not because we did the greatest body and paint and, you know, the 58 is so awesome. I mean, those are, those are true. We do a good job and the car looked great, but the elephant, right? It was written about in every magazine you can imagine. It was talked about, it was on video. Even right now, if you just type in elephant, you'll find 100 videos for it. But there were other things that went on at SEMA too employees who partook of the fruit of whose name we dare not speaketh, alcohol. We have the whole cast having a lot of fun at Vegas that we normally don't share, but I feel these days like, you know, that's gonna be our 16th season. And I just think it's time to pull back the big curtain and check out the Oz, the great Oz. Let y'all see what I gotta deal with when we go to these shows. Cause I'm just telling you right now, there's stuff goes on that you wouldn't wanna see spray painted on an overpass. You know? Now, Will and Alyssa, their job up there is to get drunk. I mean, really. I think the competition would be to see who cuckoos themselves first and who passes out. You know, Will likes to say that I get drunk a lot there just because he's insecure with the fact that he knows he gets drunk there and my dad sees him. Why don't we talk about how many beers you're gonna drink while you're down there? Because they love to hear about that. They do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> drunk. Good comeback. Yeah. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Why the constant drinking at these shows? What are you talking about? I'm talking about, about that every single time I saw you or Will, you had a drink in your hand. You started oh, out hydrated. not trying to hide it then. Nobody's that dehydrated. You know, after SEMA was over, I got back to the shop and just started working on other cars. And I think it was a few weeks after that that the actual SEMA show aired on Motor Trend, the, that episode. And it was after that that I got a call from a really nice couple, Brian and Amy. They have some movie cars in their collection. They have a really nice Bandit and they have a really nice General Lee and really has got a lot of cars. But he's trying to collect some of his favorite movie cars from when he was growing up, which I get that. He was in love with the car. His brother or brother-in-law, I don't remember now, has a bunch of the 58 Plymouth, so he already loves the style anyway, but the Christine absolutely loved it. Now, what's interesting, he didn't want the elephant. He didn't want it. He felt like this car was gonna be a driver for him and his wife, that it needed to be, you know, just a dependable, normal car. 350 Golden Commando basically is a 383, a couple of dual fours on there, electronic ignition. You've got a driver. The elephant is really in its early stages and we don't know exactly what's going to happen down the road with this so he didn't want to deal with it he also felt like a thousand horsepower is way too much for that car which it is so we made a deal for him to buy the car that we would convert it back to the way the real christine movie car looked so now like the front suspension we left that all alone okay because that was all 58 plymouth fury stuff what we did was we took a 383 which is a b engine so the 350 361 383 and 400 are all the same size blocks at a glance they look the same 350 cubic inch engines are difficult to come up with so we just made a 383 look like the 350 that you see in the movie christine Anytime we do something different, it's always kind of fun, especially when it's unique. You know, painting the engine for this car gold and doing it single stage, a Chevy color, it's cool, it looks nice. But honestly, once it goes in the car with everything being flat black and then the red, they really offset nicely and it's actually very pretty to look at. Since day one of Graveyard Cars, I've shared with my audience that our philosophy is to take your time, do the very best job you can do because there are certain things that will fail if you rush them. We did a whole episode about how plastic filler Bondo got a bad name because it was put on too thick, it was put on in the wrong environment, it had problems underneath it before they ever put the Bondo on. Well, this Christine was pretty much that situation. Unfortunately, is what happened was our mud guy sculpted the quarter panels out of Bondo. We just had 90 days to build the car. So instead of straightening sheet metal like we normally would and getting it really, really close. So you just had a thin layer of filler, we just packed the mud on it. 
That thing had a lot of mud. Now, this was only on the quarters. The doors and the fenders and the hood, they were so beautiful anyway, they hardly had any. But remember, we had to put the whole bottom half of that car on. So when you do that, you tend to shrink the metal. And that metal shrinks into a certain point. You should pull it out, metal finish it off, but that takes hours, weeks, months. We just caved and paved, the old body man used to say. So it would look good at SEMA, but we knew in reality we'd be revisiting it, and that's where we are now. The car goes through the process, everything looks great, gets down to Vegas, everything's good. Coming back, we get it unloaded, and just the trailer ride home alone broke the body work on it. It was so thick. It was almost just disheartening because you have so much time invested into it, and somebody's shortcomings just screwed everything up completely. So we had to redo the car. We had to strip both quarters right down to the bare metal. All that mud, all that filler, all that crap came off. We had to rework it, reshape it, repush it. Then we were able to do the mud work over the top of it the correct way, the way that we know it will last. At that point, we were able to hand it off to Will. We're able to strip the car back down, do it correctly, really take our time, and the car just looks, it's probably the one car I didn't want to see leave. So one of the cars that we're getting close to finishing is our 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. It's the convertible. Mark asked me to hustle on this car really quick so we can get the dash installed. So I installed the second skin so we could move on to the rest of the interior. So one of the, the tools they give us is pretty handy. You can, you know, flatten, roll it out, and then you just use the butt end of it and press it into the indentions in the floor. Pretty awesome tool. These spots on the floor right here are always, always the trickiest because you got all those divots and crazy bends in the floor. So on this one, you got to make a few relief cuts. You don't want to dig your knife into the floor, but you know, just making it look like a good cut, not like you know, just hacking this thing all up. You know, you want to make it look intentional and not just going all over the place just to make the stuff sit down. I really don't know how well the sound dender is gonna do on a convertible car, so I pretty much installed it everywhere I could that's not visible, and it turned out pretty good. In a previous season of Graveyard Cars, we restore this absolutely stunning 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner in Alpine White. We converted it to a crate Hemi engine. Which crate Hemi did we install in it? Was it the 392, the Hellcat, the Elephant? If you think you remember this episode, shout out the answer. Stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how your memory is. How'd you do on that one, folks? All right, our 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner in Alpine White with a black vinyl top, Kreger wheels. What crate engine did we install in it? If you guessed Hellcat, you are wrong. This car received the 392 crate engine with Mopar controller, a six-speed Silver Sport transmission, and a Dana Mosier rear axle. We did install a Hellephant in the world famous Christine, and the only Hellcat we've installed to date was in our Hellbird. One thing I'm really excited about is we're doing the 71 Roadrunner. Now that's not to me like, oh wow, but it's cool because it's different. And our body guy knocked it out of the park. He did such a good job. You know, it's a 440 six barrel car, options up the crap shack. This 71 Roadrunner is really gonna be a beautiful car when it's done, and super rare. It's one of like 147 ever made. It's a 446 barrel, four speed, no console, bucket seats. It's EV2 Tour Red, black interior. So right off the bat, you've got like a winner. It's a J81 car. That means it's a rear gold wing style spoiler. So in addition to that, it's a J52 car. That means that it has an inside hood release, kind of a cool little option. L31. Turn signal indicators, love it. N42, bright dual exhaust tips. Not all of them were, especially California cars. This one has the bright tips. 
It's a V21 car in addition to that. That's the hood treatment. That's the blackout with the stripes over the fenders on the 71 Roadrunner. And it's got the V8X, which is the over the roof strobe stripe. So overall, you've got a super, super rare car. It's getting close and I'm very excited to see it get done. The color, I know it's old, it gets redundant. It is orange, I got that color dialed in. Because I'm so good with this color, I do it at all the parts and the pieces, different stages. Start with the engine compartment, get that knocked out. Get a lot of my jam work done, then that way I can jump right over to the body. The color that lays out looks amazing, so by the time I hit it with clear coat, it just brings it all to life. So today I'm getting ready to install the carpet in the 1970 Roadrunner convertible. We get our carpet from ECS. They send it to us in a nice flat box. So this stuff, after it's been formed, it has not been rolled up and shoved in a box. It's laid out flat, so when I put it in the car, steam it out a little bit, make my cuts, and then this carpet is installed. Just like that. You don't get that from a rolled up carpet. This usually saves me about an hour having these things not rolled up. I only have to maybe take about five to 10 minutes to steam out this carpet. Mark doing something again. You know, and if you're wondering why I'm steaming this out, even though this got shipped to us in a flat box, this just helps the fibers loosen up and lay out even better. I know we talked about the carpet we get in from ECS before. The main advantage to it is that it doesn't come all rolled up in a box. When it comes off of the form at the company that makes them, they put it in a big flat box. So you're not right away at a deficit putting in the carpet where you have every nook and cranny is twisted up and balled up from being in a box for God knows how long. In this particular case, it's laying flat. So when you put it in there, there's a very minimal amount of steaming, pressing and fitting to get that exact factory fit. And that's why we use it on all the cars now. So once we had all the body work done, we were able to get it primered on Christine. Let it sit for a couple weeks, because again, there is no deadline, so it's really nice. Then at that point, I'm able to grab the GM Spectre Red, gorgeous color. I'm able to start getting the pink job going on that. And it's probably hands down the prettiest red I've ever shot in my life. And because I'm such a nice, generous guy, I'll even tell you the toners and how great these toners are that make such a beautiful color. The first toner in a formula is always the largest. It's a scarlet red. It's really just an outstanding red where it's darker, but these other toners I'm gonna to tell you is what brings it all together. The second one, I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's like a monstral red, which is another gorgeous red. Both these reds are just the prettiest reds we have. And then we drop into a Quindo Violet, followed by Strong Yellow Oxide, and then just a little bit of the strong white. So I have the single stage color all mixed up. It's a polyurethane, beautiful color, thick product. I use the 885 reducer, DCX61 hardener. It goes four to two to one. Four parts color, two parts reducer, one part hardener. Set the booth temp at about 65 to 70, and that way just ensures it lays out beautiful. So when we did this car the first time, you know, got that seam of crunch looming over you. I didn't get that luxury of let it dry naturally and flow out the first time. So I got that booth going about 85 degrees, which matches the reducer, which is fine. But as soon as I'm done painting it, I give it a couple hours at that dry time. Then I kick the booth up to about 130 degrees because we got to hurry up, get it dry to get a buff, to get it put together, to get to Vegas.
All right, so our little 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner EV2. Eh. Justin's in there making some final connections. EV2 Tour Red is about to get the dash in. This car's getting really close to being done. I'm so looking forward to seeing this one done. I built out the drivetrain about a year ago. We ran this on the Easy Run test stand. No leaks, ran fantastic. Here's a side note for all you Cousin Dougie fans. I'm not a fan of convertibles. My mother tried to give me a convertible 30 times and I never took the car. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine why. <laughs> Poop box. After 30 years, she finally sold the car. Anyway, I don't care much for convertibles, but this one with a four-speed air grabber hood, tore red, I think it's gonna be a real head turner. Now, you've seen us put in a million dashes, no big deal there. What I wanna talk about on this car is the fact that it's an N96 air grabber car and how cool that is and what it is, as far as mechanically, that makes the air grabber door go up. One of the coolest option codes to see on a Mopar fender tag is N96. We talked about it many, many times, that fresh air hood. Now, the fresh air hood first showed up in 1969 on the B bodies. You remember our A12 car had a liftoff hood. That technically was a fresh air hood car. Our 69 Hemi Roadrunner, the Seafoam Turquoise car, that got a fresh air induction hood. But really, that hood got its very, very coolest in 1970. On the Challenger and on the Cuda, it became a shaker, right? Most desirable option ever on one of those cars. On the B bodies, it became an air grabber or a ram charger, but functional doors. So if you go back to the yellow Roadrunner that we did a few seasons ago, that was an air grabber car. Go back to our 1971 Dodge Charger back in season two. That was a ram charger car. It means that the hood pops up and allows cold air to go into it and feed the rest of the engine. And to me, really, how it works is the most fascinating part. So this is the dash assembly we're getting ready to put in. This little jewel right here is the air grabber switch. See, in 70, this just really got cool. It's up here in bold and in your face, got the red toggle on it. Down means that it's off. When I click it like that, it means that it's on. What on means is that the trap door on the Roadrunner is gonna pop open with the cool shark's teeth on the side of it decal that says air grabber. It's, it's an intimidating little move, plus it brings in some cold air. We know that down is off up is on. This is just a vacuum switch. So if you look at actually the inside of it here, you'll see that there are three nipples on the back side of that valve. Those have to plug into something. So I want to take a second and show you what they're going to plug into. These are the vacuum lines right here that will go on the back of that switch. So if you look carefully, you'll see one, two, three, a little triangular pattern. That matches that switch. Now there's a couple others here, this line here and this line here. Those go to an electric solenoid. So the solenoid for the air grabber is installed under the dash. You know, these cars were not a collector car at the time. They were a daily driver. So when you flick that switch on to open up that air grabber, if you just turned the car off and you didn't have that solenoid, that thing would stay open. So say you got a rainy day, that's gonna flood, you know, all that water is gonna go down into your air cleaner and all that stuff. So when you turn the car off, that switch that goes to the fuse box, it bleeds the vacuum lines that door is gonna close automatically for you so you're not stuck with it open when you really don't want water or something getting in there when you're not driving the car. That this was the connection I was talking about. And these hoses go through here, all the way through the firewall, there's a grommet on the other side, and then they follow up the hood. One source gets vacuum off of the engine, the other one goes up to the servo or the actuator that makes that door go up and down. You about ready over there? Yeah, I'm good to go. Good job gonna be a nice car done. All right, we're gonna put a dash in. Now, when I get that dash in there, we have a vacuum simulator, right? Yeah. I'm a, I wanna show you exactly how that thing works because it's super cool. If you haven't seen a 70 air grabber function before, you just haven't lived. Oh, yeah. Drapala. We're calling Drapala. And Frankenstein, and I think Wolfman is on there. Who else is on there, Bride? I'd do the Bride. Oh, no. The 69 Charger we bought up in Gaston, Oregon, it really didn't take too long to finish the final assembly on. We had to remove the drivetrain and detail it correctly, and that's really all I had to do on that car. Now, this is really cool. So you guys remember the 69 Dodge Charger RT that Doug and I went up to Gaston, Oregon and bought and drug back. It had the body and paint work done. It had the engine done, transmission done, but really it needed some correcting, some cleaning up, and then it needed final assembly. Well, we finally finished that. I was on the phone one day talking to Brian that bought the 58 Plymouth Fury, and I was telling him about the car that was a really nice car, and I was getting ready to put it on eBay. 
He was looking for a 69 Charger at the time for his wife, Amy. So we just talked for a while. I told him about the car, so we didn't restore it, you know. So it may not be exactly up to our normal standards, but it's a damn nice car. And, and it could be a pretty fair price. So at the end of the day, we made a deal. He bought the car and it's going home to him. So when it comes to this beautiful T5 Charger, two things I love about this car. A, it's a gorgeous bronze color, T5 bronze. We don't see that color very often, so it is nice. B, I didn't have to paint the car. It was already done. That means no silliness in the booth from ice tray or ice poop or whatever he calls himself now. I don't know, but I didn't have to deal with anything. So I had nothing to do with this car, and it was another car out the door. Ice poop. Might be a little sir? tight popping it off, but. Saw your interview too. Which one? Oh, the one which you're making fun of my impressions. I push the lotion on the skin. Oh, that was good, huh? That was funny. Yeah. That was great. Blame them. Huh? Well, you can blame them for that Pete's one. Pete's the damn devil. He yeah. loves causing trouble with people. I didn't get time to warm up though, so. Oh, would you would your impressions of me doing impressions have been better? Probably. Were... Oh yeah. No offense to Justin or to the rest of them, but you don't need to warm up to do impressions. You just do them, right? I mean, Mel Blank didn't sit there and do Porky Pig in front of a mirror for three hours before he went on set, right? Deal, 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 deal. That's all, folks, right? It just came out, right? Which sounds like Tony. I don't know. He just did it. So you just don't need to go warm up, get all ready. Come on, man. Well, I don't have an office to go in to just sit there and practice impressions. So the question is, do I go in my office and practice my impressions all day? No, absolutely not. I do those at home. Well, I have a shop to run all day. just get to do that. I do my practicing in front of a mirror at night. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yo, Polly, you know, hey, yo, Polly, don't get mentally irregular, all right? Don't. I know that dog has no tail. It puts the lotion on its skin. Don't you hurt my dog, lady. Okay. So once we have this set on the pegs, I love it. Love it when a plan comes together. I'll hold that up. That was nice. Okay, I'll just get in here and I'll... Do you have the shark's teeth on the side of the air grabber? Have you mm. put the decal on yet? No, I haven't. Because you forgot to order them. Well, I forgot to order them, but they've been here for a week now. No, they haven't. They just came in yesterday. Well, why didn't you and put then them you on? Wanted, because I was working on a different car. Because you was working on making fun of my, my impressions. Yeah, it's like that. Hey, yo, Adrian, it's Rocky. Hey, yo, Polly, don't get so mentally irregular. Yo, Adrian, comma, it's me, Rocky. Top that. I ain't no one trick pony, okay? I celebrate the man's entire catalog. Is uh, what do they say in France? Ouvre. Ouvre. What I do is I basically I take my hat and I turn it around backwards like that. And it's like a switch that just goes on. You know, when the switch goes on, I'm like another person. You know, I don't feel like a truck. <laughs> Now, sometimes I get a little carried away and I do that. <laughs> now that Mark is done going down Rocky Lane, we can actually get this dash rolled up into place and make our final connections. Remember in Jaws? I'm not going to remember that one either. You didn't see Jaws? Oh, I've seen it. When so they found that shark's ago. tooth in that hole of that boat and Richard Dreyfus freaked all out and he jumped back and he dropped it. Oh, and okay. later the mayor said, okay, you got that tooth? And he goes, no, sorry, I dropped it. So they didn't have any proof there was a killer, oh, a killer okay. shark. Yeah. And then... Shark Week's over. My head hurts. <sighs> Thank you.
So with the dash in place and all the final connections made, I instructed Justin to go ahead and put the shark's teeth on the side of the air grabber door so I could show you exactly how everything works. Previously on Graveyard Cars, we restored this gorgeous 1971 Dodge Charger RT 446-pack Ram Charger hood car. True or false, this car was a four-speed manual transmission. If you remember the car, you should remember what it was. Stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, how did we do on that one? Our gorgeous 1971 Dodge Charger RT446 pack. True or false, that car was a four-speed manual transmission. If you said that is true, you are dead wrong, my friend, and you didn't watch the show. You should go over to YouTube and catch it because all the old episodes are there. Our car was an automatic transmission, making it one of only 98 built. Had it been a four-speed car, it would have been one of 80 built with a 446 pack and a four-speed. Our car was a triple green car, green top, green paint, green interior. Who's that handsome dope? Look at that. That's a tray, man. Ha <laughs> ha. That's super tray. Driving down the road to Springfield like everything's everything. Ha <laughs> ha. So these are actually the first shark teeth that I've done for an air grabber. I pretty much do all the graphic decals on the cars now, but Mark gave me a tip when doing these is on the clevis pin on the door, since that rotates when that door moves up and down, put a little bit of grease on the end of that thing so when you lay your decal on, it's got some lubrication so it doesn't twist or tear the decal. Now this is a trick that actually Tony D'Agostino taught me is when I did the decals on the 71 Dodge Charger air grabber door, I just put them on there. They're hard to do because they're up inside there. The thing is, they say, why don't you do it when the door's off? You can't. The clevis pin that it pivots on goes under the decal. So if you put that decal right over that clevis pin, it rotates. What's gonna happen is it's gonna tear a little hole. If you go look at all the factory original ones, they all have a hole where it grabs that decal and turns it. And you say, okay, that's fine. So Tony tells me, put a little dab of grease right there where, the, where it's at, where it pivots. That's cool, I didn't realize these had the reflective backing on it. So when it comes to wrapping up the parts and pieces, time is of the essence when it's on this 71 Roadrunner because I don't want to be bothered. I don't want silliness. The longer I'm in the booth, the more opportunity Mark has to irritate me. So at this point, I have all the bolt-on stuff in the booth ready to go. I'm able to get in there, get it painted, get it done, get it out of the booth, get it cut and buffed and put on the car, and it adds years to my life. So today is a pretty exciting day. It's the first time I'm actually gonna take my son Brody in the booth to paint. Did this car a little bit differently. I'm doing it in pieces. It makes the area smaller so I can actually work with him. He's not gonna be spraying, but I'll be able to go over how I'm doing it. If he has questions, I can answer it. He's been doing a lot of our epoxy primer. So while that isn't technical, it puts a gun in his hand. So he's been spraying a ton of primer for the past few months. So this will be the first time we get to go in there, go through the process, show him what I'm doing. 
you know, get that first coat of color on there. Then after that, he can come to me and ask questions. You know, Dad, why do you do it this way? Why do it that way? You guys remember when the movie poster came out for Jaws 2? Just when you think it's safe to go back in the water? Yeah. And just kind of break the process down really slow so he has a better understanding because I'm hoping next season he'll be where Noah's at, where he's doing more jam work, little things like that, getting more of some paint time in that's not actually doing the final paint on cars. Miyagi is here. <laughs> Mr. Miyagi. When he fixed his shoulder after Johnny swept the knee, he had to do the crane. You getting ready so at to this teach point, him. no, no. You getting ready to teach him how to do stuff like I did you 25 years ago, right? So I mean, the, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. I, I know. That's good. Hey, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Talking Miyagi, man. Dojo, Miyagi Dojo. Wax on. You know what I'm saying? So at this point, we're getting ready to head in the booth. Look like We've... Kenny G. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just be clear on this. Kenny G is not the father of Brody William Scott. They have similar hair, I get that. I don't even know if Brody's looked this up yet. <laughs> Do you know who that is? Nope. No, he's yeah. too young for that. But he's not the father. So with Brody being on board now and coming to work every day, he can see what I've spent the past 30 years dealing with working with Mark. So at this point, we got the paint ready to go. Will ate some raw oysters at the coast this weekend and crapped his pants. Well, I'm 60 years old, Mark is 59. I've known him my whole life. That's half a century of crazy. Crazy. Well, you got a zipper on the back of your pants right around your butt. And that's a cut. Well, after dealing with Mark's silliness, and that's behind us now, I was able to get in the booth and get the Roadrunner painted. The car as a whole, there's a lot of surface to cover. So we're looking at four gallons sprayable of material. That's just color on top of doing three coats of clear. So while I did it all apart, made it quick and easy, it's a lot of surface area to cover. So honestly, I can't wait to see this car done. It's got all the right things on it. It's a four speed. I think it'll be a stunning example of what we can do, especially when you look back at what it looked like when it came in. That's graveyard cars. Heroes and villains. Angels and devils. If you didn't have Mark Warman, you'd have to invent him. And that's Don King, Made in America, 1997 movie. <laughs> Remember, he cheated Muhammad Ali out of a bunch of money and stuff? The bad guy. <laughs>